Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and whenever we hear the letters IDF, we think of the amazing young men and women who protect the state of Israel as soldiers in the Israel Defense Forces. We imagine tank commanders and paratroopers and ground forces. Those of you who know more about the IDF, you might think of the Golani or the Givati Infantry Brigades, the Armored Division's Tank Brigade, or of Sayeret Matkal, a commando unit considered to be the best combat unit in the Israeli army and one of the best special forces units in the world. By the way, Benjamin Netanyahu served as a captain in Sayeret Matkal for five years and Bibi's brother, Yoni, was also a captain in Sayeret Matkal and was the captain who headed Israel's iconic rescue operation in Entebbe where Yoni was tragically the only IDF fatality. But there's one Israeli unit most American Jews have heard nothing about because until very recently it was Israel's secret unit with the most specialized purpose, namely to bring the most brilliant young Israeli minds together to think, to use their brilliance to innovate, to create the most sophisticated defense weapon system in the world as well, as well as many other technological innovations relating to satellites and space exploration and cybersecurity and high resolution cameras that have been critical to Israeli intelligence. This secret IDF unit is called Talpiot, which is a name that appears in the biblical Book of Songs and means sturdy strongholds. And now you can read the amazing story of the Talpiot unit in a riveting book appropriately entitled Israel's Edge. And on this edition of L'Chaim, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing you to the author of Israel's Edge, Jason Gewurz, who, when he's not writing eye-opening books about the IDF, is an executive producer at the financial cable network CNBC where Jason currently produces the Fast Money Halftime Report, a daily look at the stock market. And in addition to his many other producing credits in the world of finance and energy, Jason Gewurz covered business news in the Middle East and in Israel extensively for CNBC. And now Jason has authored Israel's Edge, the story of the IDF's most elite unit, Talpiot, what a pleasure it is having you at this table. Thank you for joining me. The pleasure is mine. Thank you for having me. Uh, I want to talk for one moment about you and then about the book. Because here you are, a CNBC producer. You've been in television how, how many years? More than I can count. Okay. Uh, more than 20. A long, a long sure. time. Right? Although you're very young, <laughs> Jason. And then you do a book about Talpiot. So first I want to say your Jewish background where were you raised and what kind of Jewish home were you raised? Um, well, I was raised in sort of a traditional home in uh, Rockville, Maryland. Um, and uh, I, I've been here, though, in, in the New York area for about, uh, for about 20 years. What do you mean a traditional Jewish home? Um, well, we uh, would observe uh, Shabbat. Yes. Uh, we would uh, light the candles on Friday nights. Yes. And, of course, we would um, celebrate all the holidays. You have bar mitzvah ceremony? Sure, of course, yes. You remember it warmly? Uh, very warmly, yes. What was the synagogue? Uh, it was uh, Beth on me in, in Rockville. Very nice. Passover seders? Yes, we did. Two. Nice memories. <laughs> uh, yes. You did uh, both nights? Sure. Oh. Uh, always family and friends, and it was, uh, it was always very nice. Mm -hmm. uh, siblings? I have one brother. What's his name? His, his name is Jeffrey. Jeffrey. Yeah. And older or younger? He's younger than I am. Okay. Nice memories growing up with him at seders and other... Only, only nice memories, not just of satyrs, but, uh, but everything. That's lovely, lovely. Were your mother and father involved in Israel at all? 
they were always uh, proponents of the state, um, and uh, they've been, um, they've, they've visited, um, and uh, you know, they, they always taught us that it's important to, to, uh, to know what Israel has done, and, um, and that it's, it's always there for us. What are your parents' names? Uh, Michael and Sarah. Michael and Sarah. I mentioned before we went on the air, you have this lovely dedication at the front of your book. Well, thank you. Where you say, you dedicate the book to virtually every member of your family. It's lovely. But you begin with your father, who you say is the most honorable person you've ever known. Tell me about Michael. Um, he is an honorable fellow. Um, I think he's one of the most honest people I've ever met. And uh, he would uh, he'd do anything for you that he possibly could. And um, I think he really taught me a lot about, uh, certainly about Israel, but also certainly about life. That's lovely. Your mother's the most selfless person. Always there to help. Uh, always has a, a nice thought. And... Um, really very, I'm lucky to have both of them. Okay. So that the question becomes, how does somebody in television ultimately end up writing a book about Tal Piot? And again, at one point, Jason, this is a secret. Sure. Okay. I don't know. It, in some way, you may have revealed the secret. This book may be breaking news in the Jewish world because I don't remember hearing about Tal Piot before you wrote Israel's Edge. How did it happen? So, I love that question. Um, I was uh, working for, um, for CNBC and NBC News during the war in 2006. And uh, I was working in, in northern Israel, and in, by the way, in southern Israel as well, where there were attacks from Gaza at the time, um, during that, that, the second Lebanon war, I'm sure you remember. Sure. And I was working with a reporter from NBC News named Martin Fletcher, who, who many of you probably remember. And um, every once in a while, Martin liked to take a day off. And um, I was there, I was ready to go. I went to cover it you know, 24 seven and every day, every, every once in a while he needed a day off. So um, he was a veteran and uh, he knew exactly what I was doing, what he was doing. And uh, so I would follow him on, on, on that day off and I would do other things. But one of the things that I would look at obviously is the newspapers to see what was happening. And I kept coming across a um, sort of a common theme with many companies in Israel that they were headed by a former graduate of this Talpiot program, which I had never heard of before. It would use the name Talpiot. That's right. Okay. So in 2006, it wasn't a secret. Um, by the way, in, in Israel, it, it hasn't been a secret for some time. Okay. Um, I didn't do anything that, would, that the IDF would be angry about. And by the way, I, in, in some ways, they helped me with the book. Did you have to have permission to do this book? So I did not have to have permission, but it's a very long story as to how I got there and how how Tell me the story. Okay, they, they tell were me the but, story. It, but anyway, so I was, I was there, I, I found the common thread with Talpio, and I decided to pull one string, one string, and um, I realized that this would be a great book. It would be a great story. It wasn't a TV story because it's too long, okay? It, it needed to be told in a book. So I knew immediately that it was a book. Um, after the war, I went to the uh, IDF spokesperson unit, and they loved the idea. They think it's a great idea. They're willing to help me however they can. But then as they climbed up the ladder, it got harder and harder. And um, I remember somebody called me from the Ministry of Defense, and he told me, um, he said, look, you're never going to have enough information from us to write a book, not ever. He goes, maybe a short newspaper article or a magazine article, but we're never going to help you write a book. But I really knew in my heart that this was a book. Um, so I started with graduates of the program who were already out and um, who, uh, who weren't in the Army anymore. And one guy led me to three guys. Three guys led me to five guys. And they always knew what they could tell me because some of the things that they have are, are, are off the record or are things that they, they can't publish, publicize yet. But I was very, uh, they were very good about telling me what was public and what, what they could help me about. Um, after about three or four years, um, I got sort of a cryptic phone call from somebody in the Ministry of Defense. It was somebody else. Um, and he told me that uh, basically, we're not going to stand in your way anymore, but we're also not going to help you. Um, I don't know exactly how they knew that I was still working on it, but they knew. I also got sort of a similar call from a friend of mine who worked in psychological operations. And I have no idea how they tied the two of us together, but they did. And he also had that message. They're not going to get in your way anymore, but they're not going to disturb Were they one. somehow in your way up till then? I think they had may. I, I can't say for sure. But it's possible if they had told people not to talk to this guy. Um, I knew some people were on guard when I would call or visit or talk to them. Um, and I think the IDF spokesperson unit became a little bit not as responsive as I would like them to be. With about, I was pretty much done. I probably had about six more months of, of, of tinkering and writing. This took about seven or eight years, by oh, the way. I'm amazed it took, yeah. you, you worked on this for a long seven time. Seven or eight years of research and writing, yeah. And you were in Israel the whole time? No. 
So um, a lot of the time I was here in the United States, yes. and I would I traveled to Israel probably six or seven times for the book. Um, and then I also traveled to other cities in the United States where there happened to be Tapio graduates. Chicago, there's some, um, and uh, I spoke to some in London. Um, and as you sort of get into this network, they're very helpful. Okay. Um, but let me just tell you the very end here. So with six months ago, the IDF called me and said, how can we help you? Ah. Um, and, uh, and the Ministry of Defense did too. So they saw that I was, I was diligent, that I was telling a good story. The word got back to them. And in the end, they decided to help me. And they're actually very helpful. Um, I, as an American, did not have to um, submit to any of their sort of censorship rules, uh, an Israeli would, but I voluntarily did so. And we were able to come up with compromises to, to almost all of the problems that we had. And there were, by the way, some, some areas that they didn't want me to publish. And there were some areas where I felt I had to back down, and some areas where they, I made a good argument and they agreed with me. Okay, the book is very comprehensive. Incidentally, this is a wonderful read. It reads very easily, and it's gripping so that you're a very good writer. You, you, for somebody who spends all his life in television, you also write beautifully. Well, I also had a very good editor. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Um, but for you to be involved in this and to stay with it for six, seven, eight years, it had to be a passion. It really was. And how, that's what I want you to Why? How did it become a passion for you? I was just so interested in, this, in these guys and, 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 and women in many cases, by the way, also. Who had it's done, the people, isn't it? It's the people and what they've done and how little publicity there is about it. And I knew that I could really tell a good story here if I, were able to get, if I was able to get the right help and the right contacts. And, um, and, and it worked out. Um, I really enjoyed writing it. I thought about it all the time. And uh, it, 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 I'm glad that it was able to, to turn out and to, well, to be Well, you published. did a fabulous job. By the way, you write about your wife and the dedication, the most caring, wonderful person you've ever known. How did she feel about the fact <laughs> that you were consumed by, the, by this fruit. Well, I hit a lot of it, so she didn't really know. <laughs> that's true. Um, yes, it's true. So she didn't know about it step by step, but she knew at the end. Um, but, um, but yeah, she, she, okay. she didn't know the whole way. So now let's talk about Tal Piot. Sure. You write in the book, no other group of soldiers has had a more profound impact on Israel. And you're talking about defense, how weapons are developed and used. Explain to us what is Talpiot's sure. contribution? As opposed to other units, which are military primarily, uh -huh. the people who were, who were selected, and it was a, you write about it, it's a rigorous selection process, yes. beginning in high school. Sure. The people who are, who are taken to Talpiot are near geniuses. I would, ar I would, I would agree. Many of them would say they're not geniuses. Um, they're some of the most affable, nicest, humble, humble? people I've ever met. I'd say ordinary I, guys. I've, there's about and gals. there's about one thousand graduates of the program. Yes. Okay, since 1980. Okay, I interviewed about I think about 115 of them, which is a, a very good percentage. Yes. Out of those 115, I would say two of them were not so humble. The other 113 <laughs> really were humble, and um, it was amazing to me how gracious they were, um, how smart they were, and and really how terrific they were. And their minds are simply operating, in many cases, on a different level. They would disagree. They would say that they're normal people um, that had great training. Um, I, I, would, I would beg to differ. Yes. It may be both, by the way. But. Mm -hmm. To begin at the beginning of Talpio, mm -hmm. you are very careful to explain that it was in some way moved by the Yom Kippur War. Yeah, absolutely. Explain how. So um, Israel won a great victory, as you know, in 1967. Okay, in those inter-year wars, France dropped Israel as a main supplier, and we had um, a, a terrible war between Egypt and Israel during that time, the War of Attrition. Um, most people forgot about the War of Attrition, but Israel really was, was sort of left alone during that War of Attrition right through the Yom Kippur War, where the Russians were showering Egypt and Syria and other Arab allies with weapons and technology and military intelligence, and Israel wasn't really advancing like it used to advance. Um, Israel didn't really have the capability at this point to keep up with Russia. Um, the Yom Kippur War broke out, um, and Israel lost those first few days of the war, and they lost it for, for a couple of main reasons, mainly military intelligence and technology. Can you imagine Israel right now losing any sort of anything, even a day's worth of competition in military intelligence and technology? It's unheard of. It'd be impossible. Um, but it really did happen. Coming after the war, um, two professors, Israeli professors, who happened to be on, not sabbatical, but were teaching in the California system, saw what was happening. They were frightened, and they thought that they may have a way, 
in order to sort of help Israel catch up to the superpowers in terms of intelligence and military technology. And they became the parents. They became the parents. Name them. Uh, of course, it's um, the, the real one is, uh, is Shaul, Yad, Shaul Yatsev mm -hmm. and Felix Dothan. Um, Felix Dothan really sort of took the mantle by himself, but those two professors were really the first to, to come up with it. And they used the Palo Alto Research Center, which was originally developed by Xerox, as sort of their model. Um, once they got back, they tried to put that into place, but they realized Xerox had more money to invest in Park than Israel did into anything. Um, so they sort of had to come up with a different way. And their program, by the way, was rejected year after year. Yes, you talk about how hard it was sure. for them to also break through. Uh, the, yeah. And it was not until Menachem Begin became prime That's minister correct. that there was an Israeli government ready to embrace this. It seems that way. That's absolutely correct. So before that, before Begin won in 77, 78, I think many of the generals in the government were much more interested in rebuilding what they had lost without sort of thinking about what do they need. Um, and of course, there's an argument to be made there also that Israel needs needed new tanks, Israel needed new airplanes. They lost hundreds of tanks in the Yom Kippur War. And I think they lost about, uh, I talked about it, it 25 to 30 percent of the Air Force during that war. Um, so they needed to rebuild the infrastructure. And these guys were really thinking out of the box. Okay. And Israel wasn't ready to think okay. out of the box. What was Yatsiv and Dothan really suggesting the, the IDF do? They were suggesting having an elite program to think, to help people sort of get Israel a generation ahead in terms of military technology and intelligence, and to keep on par with the superpowers, certainly Russia, China at the time, and really, to be honest with you, the United States as well. Mm -hmm. The United States, as you see from time to time, will make deals and, and has other allies beyond Israel in the Middle East. Israel believes, and, and Dothan certainly believed this as well, that um, Israel really needed to keep up to a certain extent with the United States on these levels because the United States always had the power to sell these great weapons that in many cases only the United States can mass produce to Saudi Arabia and to, to other countries in that area, Egypt as well, of course. Mm -hmm. um, we just saw actually recently the United States signed a huge memorandum of understanding with Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. um, for weapons. Mm -hmm. um, so Israel has to keep up with the United States and they certainly feel pressure to do so. Okay. You indicate that the IDF, however, was adamant that even though these particular people in the IDF, their primary goal was to think, they also wanted them to be soldiers. Absolutely. Um, soldiers first, actually. All along, they went through basic training. They often went through basic training with either with elite soldiers. Um, oftentimes, the paratroopers uh, were, the, were the main people that they would go through basic training with. Um, for your first three years of this program, what you do is that you're at Hebrew University, and you're studying four years of material in three years. There's really no vacations. Um, you're with Tapiotes all the time, um, and you're learning physics. You're learning mathematics and computer science at a very high, high level. Um, don't forget, Israel is a country where most kids don't go to college until they're 23, 24 years old. So here you have these 18-year-old kids that are learning at the same, that are learning faster than kids five years their senior. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're learning in those three disciplines. During what normal people would call a vacation, instead of what they do, they take a break from their studies to go out into the field to learn how the tank, how, how the tank drivers drive their tanks, how the, uh, the gunners fire their weapons, yes, etc. They had to be part of every unit. Every single unit, correct, so that they can really see the landscape of the entire IDF. And then the goal here is to be able to combine that, um, that, that, that classroom learning with what they learn in the field in order to become really research and development geniuses. In addition to that, by the way, after their three years, um, you have a, this is a 10-year program, by the way. No other program in, in the IDF is like this. It's a 10-year program. They must commit to 10 years. You must commit. So imagine being 17 or 18 years old and committing to something for the next 10 years of your life. That's yeah, more, than wait, half, uh, uh, more than half Jason, of your life. What kind of young person was attracted, is attracted to Talpiot? So people who are certainly um, very motivated to learn and who are very motivated to help the state of Israel, okay? Mm -hmm. That really defines, I think, a, a lot of people. I know that enrollment numbers are now at 70%, maybe 65, 70%. Um, this is really the cream of the crop. And the manpower unit, and there is a human resources arm of the IDF, really determines that this is the number one desperation, the top priority for the IDF recruiting is this unit, top you out. I'm sorry, 70% of what? 70% of Israelis go to the army now. 70% uh, yes. are able to get out for yes. medical yes. reasons, for ideological reasons. It's not a good fit. And among that 70%, those who go into Talpiot mm -hmm. would be what percent? Oh, it's uh, it's it's about forty. It's about forty kids a year. You're right. So the IDF doesn't exactly uh, release exact draft numbers, but I think it's around fifty thousand a year, something along those lines. 
Um, so it's, it's way smaller than 0.01%. As you describe the story of Talpiot in Israel's Edge, you do it by introducing us to people. Sure. It's all about the, these, they start as young kids, and right. then they're 27, 28 yeah. by the time they're done. And some of them even stay longer, yes? Yes, some of them stay for life. Okay. Um, and every one of them, it seems to me, at least the ones you were able to talk to and then put in the book, was unusual. What was it like getting to know them as people? Um, like I said, they're all humble, affable guys, except for those two that I mentioned. We'll leave their names out. Um, but um, they, were, they really did operate on a different plane. And their dedication, I'd say, to Israel and to making, Israel, to making the army better. Can you imagine being 24 years old and having such a huge impact on a battle somewhere? I mean, they say that, that an ID, a Talpiot can have a 1% to a 2% impact on a small battle. I mean, that's a huge thing. I mean, that I could do take hundreds. What? what have they done? Okay, so basically what they do is they do research and development for the Army, okay? Um, they will create or help create or help test or help improve all of Israel's weapons so that Israel really is a generation ahead of its enemies, okay? Um, you've heard of the, the Arrow anti-missile, okay? That what came from a Talpiot creation. Talpiots didn't actually put the whole thing together, but they helped manage the project in many ways. Um, Talpiots helped manage the F-16 project um, by helping to put Israeli components in those American-made planes, and I imagine they've done the same thing with the F-35s. Um, while Talpiots had an early idea for something that became the Iron Dome, they're not necessarily credited with giving birth to the Iron Dome, but there's a great oh, a woman in the book, uh, a lovely young lady named Marina Ganlon, and what she did is she was able to help come up with a software program that allowed the Iron Dome to decide when a, a rocket from Gaza was going to be a real threat and come into the a community in southern Israel, or when it was going to fall harmlessly in the desert. So those missiles that the idea that the Iron Dome fires, they can cost between fifteen, I think, and thirty thousand dollars a pop. And those missiles that they put together uh, in Gaza can cost three to four hundred dollars. Um, so you don't want to shoot a twenty thousand dollar missile at a four hundred dollar missile that's going to fall harmless. So really, that was one of her major contributions: is mm -hmm. to come up with a way to save Israel this money. Israel doesn't look at it, of course, as saving money, but it, it does save money. Are these kids patriotic? All of them. Um, you can't be in the unit unless they determine that you're patriotic, and they have ways of determining who really is and, and who really isn't. But you wouldn't want to put somebody there. Also, somebody who isn't patriotic probably wouldn't want to serve yes. for, for 10 years. I should also add, by the way, that many of these guys aren't just thinkers, tinkers, and, and research and development. They often go into the field and become fighting soldiers. Many um, pilots for F-16s have come from Talpiot. Um, several um, high, several uh, naval commanders have also come from the unit, and certainly many ground forces, uh, guys who became leaders of ground forces. There's one guy that I write about in the book um, who was in Shaldag, which is a unit, sort of an elite unit, a part of the Air Force. And while he doesn't fly, what he does is he helps determine targeting way behind enemy lines um, for, for, the, for the bomber pilots. Mm -hmm. He came through the Tapio program and is, and is now one of the leaders. May I ask you about certain people you write about in the book? Sure. And if you... I don't know if it's fair to you because, again, you wrote the book a, a little while ago. Let's give it a shot. But let's give it a shot. Okay. Um, Ophir Shoham. Sure. Ophir Shoham became the highest ranking of the Talpiot. Uh, he became um, in, in charge of Mafat, which is really the research and development arm of the IDF. He started off, I think he was in the second or maybe the third class of, of Talpiot, so that would have been 1980-81. Um, and um, he was a real fighter. He went on to become, I think, one of the first combat officers in that he was uh, aboard a naval ship um, after finishing his three years at, mm -hmm. uh, at Hebrew University. Mm -hmm. um, he has been become known as one of the fathers of modern uh, anti-missile defense in Israel. Amazing. Yeah. He just retired, by the way. Spend one more moment talking about Mafat because it's sure. the name most American Jews Sure, it's know. an acronym. I won't give it to you in Hebrew, but basically right. what it is is um, it's like um, it's the research and development arm of the IDF. So if the IDF uh, says, hey, we need to improve a tank, Mafat may try to help improve that tank. Uh, actually, many times what Mafat would say, hey, you need to improve this tank. That's Here's right. what you would do. Right. Um, and, and that's what Mafat does. You write about the fact that, in essence, Mafat and Talpiot work very closely together. Very closely, of course. Okay. Giora Karnblo. So Giora Karnblo became an F-16 fighter pilot. Um, and did he become, was he the first? No, he wasn't the first. He, he, he was not. There, okay. there were others before him. Um, but he was, I think he came from maybe the, I'd say, eighth, ninth, or tenth class, something like that. I think it was. Don't quote me on that. But it, it, okay. was, it, it was the middle of the road. And he wanted to fly F-16s. He always wanted to fly F-16s. Yes. And he wasn't the only one. There's many of them who did. 
and he actually made it through the program and, and it wound up flying F-16s. Um, and um, you know, as he was sort of being recruited, being recruited into Tapio, he said, you know, I'd really like to be a pilot. And they said, that's okay, you can be a pilot, but first you have to do Tapio. And uh, he questioned that, but he certainly went along with the program. Um, and by the way, in many choices, you don't really have much of a choice. I think if they really want you, um, they're going to, to find a way to get you. Um, my favorite was Natan. Okay, so Tell the story one of, of mine as well. So we call him Natan because he didn't want his name to right. be used. He does a lot of business in Europe, and unfortunately, many Israelis um, sometimes have a fear of doing business in Europe because in many cases, there are laws or threats that they'll be arrested for something that Israel or the army has done um, while they were in the army. Um, How old is Natan now? Natan is probably 40, probably maybe 38, 40. Okay, 30, 30, tell 40. his story. So Natan was a 12-year-old boy, and he was uh, lived in, in the northern of the country, and he went in one day for a routine eye exam. And the doctor, as, as this happens, I imagine in Israel, said, what would you like to do you know, when you join the army? And he said, I want to be a fighter pilot. And the doctor looked at him like he was crazy. And he said, you know, you're never going to be a fighter pilot. And he looked at him and said, why not? And he said, because you're colorblind. And they don't take colorblind pilots. He didn't know he was colorblind. So he looked at his mother, and his mother was very concerned. He didn't want to see her son uh, rejected or, or not, be, not be able to live his dream. And he literally said to her, don't worry, Mom. One day, I'm going to create planes that don't need pilots. And he became the father of, uh, of the, the modern-day drone program in Israel. Um, and that's not all he did. He was also very interested in cameras. So along the route, while he was doing Talpiot, he came up with a camera that, uh, that really improves upon the vision of a drone. And then he decided when he was 24, 25, um, you know, I really always wanted to be in the real green army um, also. It's another dream of mine. So he went back and he started, you know, uh, basic training as, as a regular cadet. And he wound up becoming a, uh, a commander in a now a reserve unit that's designed to go way behind enemy lines, you know, 15 miles behind enemy lines and kill approaching tanks before they get a real run at Israel. So here's a guy, this is a dream of Talpio. Okay, they have this guy who invented a camera that goes on a drone. Yes. And he also, by the way, a camera that can also go on a shoulder fired missile. And he can command the troops to take this missile that he was able to, to find using a drone that he created to help, to help do surveillance on the target and kill enemy tanks way behind the lines. Now, all Talpiotes don't become exactly like him, but yes. this is one case of a, of a, a real super superman. A, a, a superstar. No um, question. Boy, tell the story of his encounter with the head of the Israeli Air Force. So um, he was, uh, I think, a second year or so um, in, in, in Talpiot, and um, they were talking. He was a kid. He was a kid. He was probably, you're right, he was 19 years old. And they do tours of sort of Air Force bases, Army bases, et cetera, as they're going through the program. And um, he was looking at F-16s and F-15s, and a, a top general in the Air Force had told him why they just invested so much money in the F-16s. And he said, well, why would you do that? Doesn't seem like a good plan. It seems like the F-15 would be sort of the better way to go. And they're taught to challenge the leadership. Mm -hmm. They're taught to think on their own and not just take for granted what they're told. In the United States, I don't know what happened. Uh, there may be a reprimand. But in Israel, they actually like the criticism and they like the questions. Um, and they're able to have a give and take, whether it's a general to a private or, or whatever it is. The generals don't shy away from those tough questions, and the privates don't, ge don't shy away from asking them. Yes. It's something Both, unique, by the way, I believe, to the Israeli I army. understand. Both Natan and it was, Avi, uh, it was General Avihu Ben Nun, uh -huh. who was the, head, he was the head commander of the Israeli Air Force. Correct, at the time. Yeah. And here he's describing their dis his decision to buy the F-15 And this kid sure. is saying, you're out of your mind. Right. That's right. And as you point out, it, there was no reprimand. It was appreciated. Correct. A lovely, lovely story. They're taught to challenge. Yep. And anyway, he was my favorite. Harrell. Uh, Harrell. Uh, Harrell is the, is the one yeah, who is mind. moved when AOL uh -huh. oh. buys ICQ sure. for a $287 million. Sure. And that brings us to a different aspect of the people who go through Telpio. Right. Um, so about a third of them, as you said, stay in the Army um, throughout their careers. About a third of them go on to be professors all over the world, and a third of them go into business, executives. Um, and they've created some of Israel's most valuable companies. Um, so ICQ is actually before Talpio. Some of them were probably involved on, on, the, on the back half. Um, but they weren't involved in sort of the birth of that company. Um, but um, they did um, CompuGen, which is a name many investors would know. It's a trades on the NASDAQ. It was really sort of one of the first companies to map the human genome. Came right from Talpio, Talpio graduate. XIV, one of the first cloud computing companies, came from uh, came from um, came from Talpiot. 
Um, that company was bought by IBM, I think, for about $400 million. Um, another great uh, company is, is, uh, is a company that makes the memory, or really improved the memory in everybody's iPhones. Um, that's, you know, it's another one. Uh, there's really a, a, a great growth of leadership and executive leadership that has been born from Talbiot. Um, so not only are they creating weapons, but in Israel, they're also creating jobs. Mm -hmm. And that's something that also Israel obviously needs very much. Have any of the Talbiot graduates, after they leave Talbiot, mm -hmm. develop corporations that become wealthy? Absolutely. Um, so Checkpoint Software is another great example of that. I think probably every Fortune 500 company in the, in the, in the world has, has a slice of Checkpoint Software. Um, and what they do is really they were one of the first to, um, to sort of tell people that the internet, you're going to be online and you're going to need to be protected. And there's a great story in there about a guy named Marius Nacht um, who, uh, who came from Romania. And his father never believed that he would uh, sort of become some sort of executive. He wanted to go to an art school, which is, is fine in itself. He didn't know that his son was a genius. It turned out his son actually was extremely smart. He wound up being recruited by Talpiot. Um, he wanted to drop out after a while because a lot of these guys have a problem with it because they're all of a sudden, they're always the smartest guy in their high school. They're always the smartest kid around. And now all of a sudden they're in a classroom with only the smartest kids. And he wasn't excelling. Um, so he wound up getting some, some help, some um, to some psychological help, actually, and they're very open about it. And he, after that help, um, he really started to excel. After his 10 years in the Army, he wound up working with the Jamaican Air Force in order to improve their radars, because he loved being in Jamaica. After that, he was asked if, uh, you know, to, to start one of these um, you know, sort of companies out of his friend's basement. He wound up doing that, and it morphed into Checkpoint. Um, when he first started selling Checkpoint, he went to a company, um, I, I don't know if I won't say the name. It's in the book. Um, and they were completely... Well, if it's in the book, say the name. They were, they were completely shocked. <laughs> they were completely shocked that anybody could think that at some point there'd be some sort of an internet where people would go and do their banking yes. or shopping <laughs> online. The chief technology officer of that company wound up getting fired shortly after he rejected Checkpoint, uh, saying we didn't need your product. Um, and, of course, the internet really bloomed. And they were really the first one in the space. But he describes himself, Morris Knox, as a traveling salesman, traveling Jewish salesman, yes. who literally would live in his car for six months at a time, going from company to company in the United States, explaining the new need for this new technology that they had developed. And he was right. He was right on. That's correct. Talk about Talpiot's connection to the space program in Israel. Sure. Um, many, I don't know if everybody realizes this, but Israel is very active in space um, beyond... Um, in terms of satellites, um, they have many that are for commercial use, but also, for, of course, for military use. Um, there's a story in there for one kid in Talpiot. He didn't really know what he wanted to do after his first three years, with his seven years in research and development, until they took him to Palmachim Air Force Base, where they launched the uh, rockets from. And he said it was an eye-opening, magical moment for him. He spent the next six, seven years of his life working on one camera, that could be operated better from outer space. And it was a huge success. It's, he says you can't quite see license plates today, like you see in the movie. He says, but you can see pretty much everything about that. Um, and he really wound up to, to create sort of that technology. I think Israel has launched 12 or 13 indigenous satellites now, um, at least with the military program. Um, after he wound up leaving, he didn't want to stay in the military anymore because he decided that was really the pinnacle. There was nothing that he could do beyond what he had, had just done um, to create this thing that you could operate with a joystick from outer space. And then he would also brief intelligence officers about what they were seeing sort of through the images that would be sent back. He wound up working for a company called uh, Nano Retina that helps, um, that's going to help people who have eyesight problems, people who are blind, see again through this artificial retina, which comes right out of this, uh, right out of the camera that is that, that he helped create that's in space now. It's amazing. Yeah, these kids, these guys really are amazing. Amazing. And you know, the word elite is used a lot in relationship to Israel in general and the IDF. Very often it's elite unit. It's an elite unit. Sure. And I'm not saying it isn't. There are there, a lot of elite units. There are. Deservedly so. Exactly. This, however, is legitimately an extraordinary elite unit of young men and women. Would you not agree? That's the argument of my book. Um, I would <laughs> argue that it's the most elite, and that, like I said, it's had really the most impact on Israel. While um, you're not going to see these guys storming a building every day, um, which, by the way, elite troops certainly do, um, you're going to see how these guys help those other elite troops do their jobs better. 
Um, and without them, Israel would not be in the position that it is in now, military, militarily speaking, and certainly on the intelligence front as well. Many of these guys also go on to work with the Mossad, and many of them also go on to work with um, Unit 8200, which is sort of like, sort of the equivalent of the Yeah, but wait, talk about 82, you write about 8200, and I don't think many American Jews know what that is. So, um, 8200 is a an elite computer unit, uh, and what they do is they are able to tap into so all sorts of computer and technology and, and telecom units all over the world, communication networks all over the world. Um, and many times what the Talpiotes will do is they'll wind up um, working in conjunction with 8200 and also sometimes being an officer to lower ranking 82 members of 8200. Um, there are all sorts of units that I discovered, by the way, while, yes, while doing this yes. book. Um, and they're not necessarily secret, but they're not necessarily things that are just out in, the, in conversation all the time. Were there times when you got chills? Um, not chills, I wouldn't say, but there were things that definitely surprised me. Um, there were things that I had to take out of the book um, that surprised me. I assume um, if you had to take it out of the book, you can't tell me I can't, what it is. I wouldn't tell you what they like, but can I can give you. I can it? speak around it. Um, and that's, by the way, what many Talbots do is they can speak around something to give you just enough information. Um, the the army and uh, sort of the censorship units were a little bit nervous constantly about some of the things that um, that they were doing that at one point may have targeted countries that they would like to be friendly with. Um, and in many cases, they backed away from those targets, but those technologies existed in order to better use intelligence uh, to, to go after those targets. And in, in many cases, they backed away. I wrote about it just like that, but they preferred that I took that out. And it wasn't material to the book, so I took it out. Mm -hmm. um, there's a uh, sort of a, you know, a great thing in um, when Israel started to withdraw from the Sinai in the, in the early 80s, these first classes of Talpiot were tasked with taking sort of uh, intelligence um, tools that had been in the Sinai out of the Sinai. And that was really sort of one of their, their first real um, missions. And one more other thing that brought, close, brought me close to chills, I would say, is, is going through the archives. Um, they don't really have sort of a, an archive department like we have at the Smithsonian. Um, they have sort of a library at Hebrew University. And um, going through some of the original notes and some of the original plans and the original memos that established this, um, being able to find those and uh, sort of decipher the Hebrew, and I had some help, by the way, um, really was uh, you know, amazing. I write a lot about a lot of that in yes. the book. And their early outlines, by the way, turned out to be you know, exactly successful um, mm -hmm. to, to exactly shaping the program. Mm -hmm. I may have not been clear about what I meant. And again, it may not apply to you. When I'm reading about some of these individuals, I get chills. It's the people sure. who, who just move me. And so what I really was asking you, did you meet people who, and it's in chills, who in some way touched you in a unique way? And I was going to ask you whether any of them became friends of yours. So the answer to the question is um, they did touch me in a unique way because they made me very proud of what they had done. Um, and sort of what Israel has been able to accomplish with people like this. Um, so I would say that it, it, it made me um, proud of their, their exemplary contributions to the state and, quite frankly, their selflessness about doing it. Um, these guys are real team players. Um, and that's something else, by the way, that they cherish in Talpiot is that they're looking for real team players. And they have all sorts of ways of finding out who is a team player, by the way, and who isn't a team player. I'm happy to talk about that as well. Yes, talk about um, that. So early, I'd say, the first couple classes um, when I would interview people, they would say um, they were looking for, you know, sort of team players and smart kids, but they would always describe themselves pretty much as eccentric nerds, okay? They didn't get exactly what they wanted out of those first few classes. It was successful enough to be able to continue the program, but they didn't refine really what they were looking for until about the eighth, ninth, tenth class. At this point, they started to allow and recruit more women into the program, um, and they also started to refine exactly how they found the people that they were looking for. And one of my favorite tests was they would put you in sort of a, a hot room of sorts, and you'd be under a lot of pressure. They'd put you into sort of groups of three or four. They'd have younger soldiers walking around the room with clipboards trying to track your every move, and they'd be looking at you through a sort of a two-way mirror sort of situation. And they would give you a complicated task that was impossible to complete, and they would say who got frustrated with it and want to give up or got angry or frustrated with their, their teammates and who, by the way, could lead without sort of any 
uh, monetary incentive for the other guys and uh, without sort of yelling or screaming. And that's how they're able to find out who are potential leaders and who are potential real team players. And they're able to do that. One example is they would give uh, sort of a group a bicycle set and tell them to uh, assemble the bicycle set, but they'd leave out a couple of parts, making it impossible to do so. Um, they would do you know, all sorts of building projects, things with uh, shoes and laces. And in many cases, these things were impossible to complete, but they wanted to see who would get frustrated and angry. And if you got frustrated and angry, if you get frustrated and angry, generally, I can't say that you wouldn't make it all the time, but many of the times that was you know, a negative. That was, that was seen as something that you wouldn't be able to advance forever in this program. Mm -hmm. By the way, the IDF isn't always right about who they take in. They lose um, a, a third to half of the recruits. They don't make it past the first year. Um, so that first year, you wind up losing many of the recruits simply because they can't keep up with the speed of the schoolwork, the coursework, and they just don't fit in with the, with the other kids. And in that case, they may go on to be, other, to be successful in other units, but not necessarily tell you. Mm -hmm. um, when you talk about the fact that it gave you a sense of pride, mm -hmm. there are so many things that are not spoken about in, a, in the American Jewish community about the state of Israel. When we talk about Israel, almost always it begins with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and how can there be peace and who's at fault. And, and there's also at the moment a a feeling among many who are disappointed in Israel has moved to the right. The Orthodox establishment seems to be gaining in its ability to influence Israeli life. So many in, in the American Jewish community are just uncomfortable with things having to do with Israel. Then we hear this kind of story. When I hear you talk about how it instilled pride in you, I'm saying to myself, I wish First of all, everybody should read your book. Thank you. Israel's I, I hope they will. Israel's <laughs> Edge. But knowing about the extraordinary things that Israel does, one of which is Talpiot, uh -huh. it gives American Jews a better perspective. Do you feel that's an accurate description? So I'm not an expert on that. I can't exactly tell you uh, how people should feel about Israel. Everyone, it's obviously complicated. I would hope that in, in one way or the other, everybody wants to support it, however they want to support it, whether it's, a, whether it's two states, whether whatever it is. And hopefully we can all sort of define what that is at some point. Today's probably not the time to do it. Um, but um, you know, it, it, having, having pride in, in yourself is, is, is important. And I think this is, in many cases, Israel's part of us. Yes. Well. Do Israelis know about Talpiot? Absolutely. So there are also companies now in Israel that will put out a, a wanted ad for you know, a new employee and say, Talpiot only apply. Oh. That does exist. In fact, I, I saw some examples of it happening in Northern Europe as well. Someone must have gotten sort of hold, and they may have been looking for employees in Israel and saying, Talpiot only apply. Um, at some point, that may become part of the lexicon in California. Okay. The problem is there's not enough Talpiots to go around yes. for everybody. OK. And I did ask you. Did any of them become friends of yours? So I'd say acquaintances, not necessarily friends. Um, I keep in touch with a lot of them, but it's a very tight-knit group. And I wouldn't fit in. Quite frankly, I'm not smart enough. And uh, you know, they really have done so much with their lives. And um, they're really operating on a higher level. Okay. So, but you did like them. Oh, yeah, absolutely. They were terrific. I, I think we got along in, in, in all cases. Um, and I think they appreciated what I, what I was trying to do here. Um, and by the way, I'm trying to make some of the, the as many as the proceeds go to charity as, as humanly possible. Um, so I was doing this, you know, as a great project for me, but um, I didn't necessarily want to benefit from all of their stories. Mm -hmm. Okay, as we get near the end of the book, you have a chapter called Reunion. Mm -hmm. And it's like paragraph after, after paragraph about the individuals we've met mm -hmm. along the book. Sure. I thought it was a fascinating way to kind of go full circle. I want to know how that idea came to you, and then how you feel about the reunion chapter. Um, I haven't I think seen it in sure, other books. Sure. I think in, in Israel, many of these guys who are in, in any of these units, by the way, do become a family. They become really close-knit. And there's no difference, I'd say, with Tapiot. The difference is that these guys also have a real networking um, 
sort of organization that they put together. I think they meet once a quarter, once, yeah, one, four times a year, once a quarter um, at a university or somebody gives, a, one of the Talpiotes gives a, a lecture on something, be it space, be it, um, be it military technology, physics, whatever it would be. Um, and they all sort of come together at these units. Um, they also say that you're never more than, you know, one degree separation away from another Talpiote. And they know exactly, if, if, you don't, if you can't do something, you know someone who can or you know someone who can lead you to that, whether it's in business or whether in your personal life or whatever. Um, so um, they, they really find, form a tight-knit unit, not only while they're in the program, but once they're out of it as well. And by the way, whether you're in the second class and you're, uh, you know, what, 50, 53 years, 54, 55 years old right now, you can also be just as close with someone who just graduated from the yes. program who's 30 years. So even though you may be separated by 25 years, um, you're not separated in terms of, you know, sort of how you get along and how you think. And, uh, and Talpio is really sort of a, a real click about them. That's lovely. And therefore, you decided what for the reunion chapter? Well, I decided that it, it should come full circle, circle and, and I wanted to show what each one is now doing yes. sort of at the end. Um, that was sort of a suggestion, I believe, with the editor. I can't take full credit for that, but it was a good one. I had the material, a, and she helped put it in the right I place. I loved it. Okay. Um, and then you end with talking about the future. Sure. So how do you see, and it's not about the future, it's simply for Telfield. Right. But as, you know, at this point in time, as you look at the future of Israel, What's your sense of where Israel is going, and if you want to tie Talpiot in, do? Um, look, I think Israel's under a constant sense of danger, um, and rightly so. I think they're, they're surrounded by enemies. They live in a very tough neighborhood, and I think we all need to understand that. Um, at the same time, Israel also has a responsibility, and Israel knows this better than anyone, that to sort of keep a humanness and an openness about it. And that's a very sort of tough those are two tough roads to sort of merge together. Um, I don't know, I can't say how they can do it, um, but hopefully they will. I know they've also had sort of a more tense relationship with parts of the Jewish community. I hope that gets solved as well. I, th I think we need each other. Um, I'm not smart enough to say how that happens, but hopefully people smarter than me, like you, can help figure that out. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Beautiful. So you write about your two girls. Be whomever you want to be, but be good and do good. You're a lovely father. Uh, how, how old are your children now, your, uh, your girls? Four and six. Oh, they're still little. Still little, yeah. Still. So still time to be good and do good. <laughs> with, they'll, I'm, with you as a father, they'll do both. Um, do you plan on going to Israel any time in the near future? I have no plans to go, but I'm always looking to go. Did you like it when you were there? Oh, I've never had a bad day. Really? Sure. Who's had a bad day there? What's to worry about? It's, it's a really very nice place. Many other places are nice also, but I, I, think, I think we all enjoy being there. Has your wife been there? Yes, yeah, sure. Why sure? Oh, she's been. She's been a couple of times. She has family there, um, so she's been able to go a few times, yeah. Have you gone together? Yes, yes. Okay, so it's, an, it's lovely for you. Yeah. Yes. I hope you go often, uh, and I hope that you know, when you go, you meet many of the people who you've written about and who you care about. As you look forward now to where you're going, any interest in writing another book? Uh, maybe at some point. I, I don't think I'm there right now. Okay. About Israel or something totally different? I would have to wait and see. I don't know. Oh, I was hoping for some breaking news no, here. No, sorry. It's fun. It, was, it was a fun project to do, um, but it was an enormous amount of work, and uh, I don't know how I, uh, I, don't, I don't know how I to do it I don't know how you did it either. Huh? Eight years. It was a long time. Good for you. You're wonderful. Oh, thank you for having me. You're, are you kidding? You're wonderful. You've written a wonderful and an important book. Thank you. I wish you could do with it. It should be on every uh, you know, Jewish bookshelf in every home. Thank you very much. And people should really get a chance to understand some of the things that you've written about. You write beautifully, and it's a wonderful and important story. Thank, thank you, you, Jason. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you very, much. very, very much. Thank you. Jason Gewurz. Senior producer at CNBC and the author of an eye-opening and uplifting book about what until now has been one of Israel's best-kept military secrets in terms of American Jewry. It's entitled Israel's Edge, the story of the IDF's most elite unit, Talpiot. It's published by Geffen Books. I recommend it highly. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed here on this edition of L'Chaim. Please email me, write me, 
post on our Facebook page, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. Special thanks this week to Jan Weiss for the production of this edition of L'Chaim. Thank you, Jan, very much. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'Chaim, my friends. of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.